have grown up in Santa Barbara, go Dons, and enjoyed all that this beautiful town has to offer, I've never come to truly appreciate this area until I lived in other parts of the world. Our town's ocean and mountain views, the Spanish colonial architecture, and the number of annual parades that happen here seem to be too many to count, right? It's all become a part of my social identity. I'm grateful to live in Santa Barbara, and there are key attributes of this town that I hope to preserve for the next generation to enjoy. As part of the greater state of California, Santa Barbara is part of its changes and pressures. Our, our population, alongside several economic factors, are growing, immigration into the state is increasing, and more jobs are being created. The practice of simply developing additional residential units and land use are sensitive topics. How should Santa Barbara respond to statewide legislation? In what ways can we carefully address housing de development while preserving our town's character? My name is Ohan Arkelian, the event leader, founder, and president of the UC Berkeley community of Santa Barbara and Ventura counties. Tonight, our local group is holding this event with presenting sponsors, UC Berkeley's Center for Environmental Design and Appleton Partners Architects to provide an academic perspective around the practice of developing housing, one subject within the very complex domain of housing. At the end of our time together, we hope that you'll have an added perspective from experts on approaching housing development in Santa Barbara. For the UC Berkeley community that is here tonight, we have come together to celebrate the upcoming 60th anniversary since the founding of UC Berkeley's Center for Environmental Design with programs including architecture, real estate development, and urban design. UC Berkeley is ranked as the number one public university in the world, and this is our local community's seventh year in promoting its welfare with over 25 events and a 1,500 member network. If you are an alumni, parent, or affiliated with Cal, please stand up and join us in our chant. <laughs> Go Bears on three. One, two, three, go Bears! From pulling all-nighters at Worcester Hall, rigorous academic curriculums, week-long rallies at Sproul, and being lectured by panhandlers about the 1960s at People's Park, we are here to share and apply what we have learned for the prosperity of the greater Santa Barbara and Ventura areas. On behalf of our community, we would like to take a moment to commend some of our supporters who have made this event possible. Our presenting sponsor, Appleton Partners Architects with Center for Environmental Design alumni, Ken Minot and John Margulis, Jessica Metzger, Matthew Ozilmeis and Rosie Deisty with the City of Santa Barbara, Lisa Plowman, Alan Bell with County of Santa Barbara's Planning and Development Department and the County Executive Office, also, to the, to the city staff, county staff, and elected officials who are here tonight to be a part of the community discussion. The Cal Alumni Association headquarters, Victoria Joshob, Gail Stanley, and Dr. Karen Chapel with UC Berkeley's Center for Environmental Design, David Garcia, Cora Johnson Grau with UC Berkeley's Turner Center of Housing Innovation, Ed DeVicente with DMHA Architecture, Sarah Sinclair with the SB Independent, Deddy Piker, Nicole Stevens, Lucrezia de Leon, Tony Tomasello, Katie Chalfant with RRM Design Group, Scott Jones with Hayward Lumber, Olivia Marr and Rochelle Rose with the Coastal Housing Coalition, Laura Bernard with the American Institute of Architects Emerging Professionals Team in Santa Barbara, Eric Davis, Erica Schweitzer, and JP Montalvo with TVSB. Dan Farrick, Michael Lewis, Alex Mel Alexis Malatesta, and Ted Singley with Kiva Cowork for being fantastic hosts and sharing our mission towards fostering community collaboration. Harrison Design, Allen Construction, our many in-kind sponsors at the back of the brochure. The several alumni and community volunteers who have helped set up tonight, thank you so much. And lastly, the Cal Community Board, Maggie Gates, Thomas Quo, and Gail Anacuchin.
Mona Miyasato is the County Executive Officer for the County of Santa Barbara. She joined the county in 2013 and reports to the Board of Supervisors. Mona oversees administration of county government, which consists of over 4,200 employees, 21 departments, and an operating budget of over $1 billion. She oversees all county functions and operations except those duties assigned to elected officers of the county. Prior to her current position, Mona was the Chief Assistant County Administrator for Marin County for five years. Prior to that, she worked for 10 years in various positions with the City of Santa Monica. Mona received a Bachelor's of Arts degree from UC Berkeley with a double major in Political Science and Economics. At Berkeley, she was a reporter for the Daily Californian. She received a Master's of Public Policy degree from Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government with a focus on community and housing development. Please join me in welcoming Mona Miyasato. Good evening, everyone. I'm really honored to be asked to introduce our speaker. But before I begin, I just want to ask, how many people are here are from the College of Environmental Design, either the architecture program? OK. OK, there's about a handful. So good, I can um, say my remarks, which makes fun of that uh, college a little bit. <laughs> um, and it's time for us to all say, for those of us in the room who are familiar with the Berkeley campus, what we've all thought, myself included, but were embarrassed to say publicly because we didn't want to expose our rudimentary understanding of our um, <clears throat> design aesthetic. And that is that Worcester Hall, where the building is, where the architecture program is housed at Berkeley, and the College of Environmental Design is housed, for many of us in the room, I'm going to say it, we think it's the ugliest building on campus. <laughs> and we're not quite sure why, but there's reasons for that. <clears throat> um, I used to think they, for those who went to Cal and know the, build, the, the campus, I used to think they built a Worcester Hall to make Barrows Hall look really good. Um, and if you don't know the building, it's a, it's a gray concrete building. It's kind of cold and bleak. It's been called, it's labeled as brutalist architecture. And according to the college website, Bill Worcester, who was the dean of the School of Architecture, had hoped that no university regent would like the building when it was finished. And he got his wish. But the style reflected Worcester's opinion that a school should be, quote, Rough, a rough place with many cracks in it, perpetually unfinished, open-ended, and a provocative environment for teaching and questioning. And with that definition, I think our cities and our communities also reflect that opinion. And just like that building, we know that form follows function. And what our communities look like, be it in the unincorporated areas of the county or the city of Santa Barbara, they are defined by and in turn define the purpose and functions of our communities. And so we're talking about housing development tonight and finding that balance that Ohan talked about that our speaker is going to address among higher density housing and neighborhood preservation, between local control and regional needs, protecting the environment by, but ensuring a fair return, of, return on investment. These are all issues we're dealing with in local government today and in our communities. And so we're fortunate tonight to have Dr. Gregory Morrow talk about some of these things to stimulate our thinking. Dr. Murrow is the Executive Director of UC Berkeley's Real Estate Development and Design in the College of Environmental Design. He came to UC Berkeley from Pepperdine University, where he served as the Executive Director of the Sands Institute of Real Estate, Academic Director of the Master in Science of Real Estate, and the Fred Sands Executive Pro Professor in Real Estate. Previously, he was the Richard Parker Professor in Metropolitan Growth and Change at the University of Calgary. His research and teaching spans the areas of real estate development, housing, metropolitan growth, and sustainable community development. He served on the Calgary Planning Commission, the LA County Homeless Initiative Measure H Citizens Oversight Advisory Board, and the Urban Land Institute of LA's Leadership Council. He holds a PhD from uh, UCLA in urban planning, an urban design certificate, and masters in city planning and architecture from MIT. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Gregory Morrow. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see nobody cares about urban housing here. Uh, this should be non-controversial at all. Um, 
I was going to go on and on about brutalism and <laughs> how that could be the new style here in Santa America. It's true. Worcester Hall is, is a bit tough to live with. It, it's too hot in the summer, it's too cold in the, in the winter. Well, thank, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the invite. To, to be, it's good to be back. Uh, I've never lived in Santa Barbara, but I lived on the very western frontiers of Los Angeles in Woodland Hills. As you can appreciate traffic in LA, it probably took me as long to get from uh, downtown LA to my house as it does from my house to Santa Barbara. So you can imagine that we actually spent quite a bit of time up here. We were members of the uh, Santa Barbara Zoo. My kids uh, enjoyed it. So we, we've spent quite a bit of time up here. But you, as you'll quickly find out, I'm not from here. Um, so let's get into this. I'm basically going to make a case for why we need to build more urban housing. And I, I, this is really to queue up a conversation later. Uh, I'm going to basically make the case that there's environmental reasons for this, there's economic reasons for this, and there's just the right thing to do. I'm going to talk about why urban housing. I'm going to talk about this idea of complete and inclusive communities. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges we have to building uh, urban housing. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some strategies, and I'm going to talk more about, not just about housing, but things around housing that make it about community building. So why urban housing, social, environmental, fiscal reasons? I wanted to start off by just framing this a little bit. Uh, you can see from the Second World War to today, Santa Bar the city of Santa Barbara was roughly half the population of the county back then and today it's about 20%. So what does that tell us? It tells us that over the last 60, 70 years or so, what, what's the pattern in the county? It's been to decentralize, it's to, been, to build more suburban uh, housing and communities and uh, not build so much in the city itself. And that's actually an important thing. And it's not unusual, it's, you, LA County is the same way other areas around this, uh, the state are the similar. So the question is, is that a naturally occurring phenomenon? Was it naturally occurring that we would just decentralize and, and push people out of the city and into the, the rural areas and the suburban areas? I, I want to put this up because it's an interesting quote. Uh, we need fewer people here. Uh, and, and, and there was this idea, and they're talking about Los Angeles, but many communities across the state started in 1970 with this proposition that you know, we, we can't have more growth. And so a lot of the problems that we face today are ironically uh, wrapped up with some of the thinking that was in the early 70s around the environmental movement. So for those of you who remember late 60s, early 70s, uh, popular books, there was the Population Bomb, Limits to Growth. Uh, anybody heard of those books? Couple, few nods, yeah. So people were concerned that unlimited growth, we, we didn't have the resources to, to be able to sustain that. And, but one of the weird and interesting things about it is this one. So this is the president of the Sierra Club talking about we need to limit residential housing as a way to lower birth rates. Uh, which, I don't know about you, but when I was thinking about having kids, the first thing I did was not look up the zoning code. Right? I mean, it just what didn't occur to me. So the idea that you can suddenly just lower housing, uh, lower the zoning down zone, and suddenly that's going to stop growth is not feasible, right? I mean, it's just not what, but that's still really the thinking today. So uh, I had done a bunch of work in Los Angeles that looked at um, how land use policy affected housing costs, how, how it affected uh, our ability to grow. And, and I'm just going to throw this up here to see, you know, back in the 1960s, the city was essentially zoned to be a city of 10 million people, even though its population was only about 2.5 million. By the time we get to 1980, they had down zoned it by 60% to a, a, a population capacity of around 4 million. But of course, you can see the population keeps going, and what you see happening is that the red line is approaching the black line. What does that mean? It means the population is actually approaching the capacity of the zoning in the city. So what do you think happens when, that, when the, you start to run out of zoning capacity? 
Well, basically what you end up with is rising housing costs, right? There's more people coming for less supply. So you get an increase in housing costs. So that's what this is meant to say. So basically up until 1970, house prices and incomes were more or less in line with one another. And as we started to downzone, as we started to say, well, we don't really want more people here. We don't want to allow more housing to be built. The house prices start to rise and rise and rise. And, that, and you can see there's a kind of inherent uh, conflict of interest, right? If I'm a, I'm a homeowner, uh, I still own a house in Los Angeles, it's great for me, you know, oh, house prices are going up, but it's not great for anybody else. And so that's part of the challenge here is that when we decouple uh, incomes from house prices, then you end up with this major affordability challenge. And it's implicated in our land use policies. That's basically what I would argue. Now, I'm not as familiar with Santa Barbara. What I do know is that similar thing happened in the 1970s where initially there was a kind of population capacity of the zoning in 1970 of about 170,000. Over the course of the, about 1976, that was cut in half to about 85,000. And you can see the population is sort of, you know, relatively stable. Uh, we haven't added a, a ton of growth, but you still see a similar pattern to what was happening in Los Angeles. So let's think about that. So what is, what's the implication of that? And the idea that we're gonna suddenly use land use policy to restrict growth is, is kind of an interesting thing in the context of what's happening in California generally. So you can see the great post-war period, we added 10 million people from 1940 to 1965. We saw a bit of a slowdown in the 70s, the 80s picked back up, and the 90s slowed down, and then we're basically keeping pace. So it's not like California suddenly is stopping to grow. So the question is, and this is always what we get, is if you accommodate growth, are you, are you actually promoting growth? And I would say if you look at what's happening, certainly in Los Angeles, the people are already there. It's not that 50, uh, so somewhere around 60% of new occupants of housing are actually locals. So it's not, the myth, it's not a myth that some people are coming from across the country. Uh, it's actually people that are already there, people's kids, mostly. So this is also important to realize, that in the post-war period, and really up through kind of the 1990s, the state of California, we produced about 200,000 units a year. And you can see it, it goes up and down with the economy, but the average is about 200,000 a year. Once we get into the 90s and early 2000s, leading up to the Great Recession, that gets cut more or less in half, a little bit more than half, 100,000. Since the Great Re Recession, 2008, 2009, we've been producing about 50,000 units a year. And keep, that, keep in mind that relative to what is essentially a kind of perpetual growth. So this is, this is part of our statewide challenge. This is why people have said, you know, we need more housing across the state. And it's, again, it's not to uh, promote growth. The growth is already happening. It's to accommodate the people that are already here. So what does that mean for us? Yay! We're 49th out of 50 in housing production. At least we're not last, right? So yay for us. So it, it's good. I mean, basically, we already have a 2 million uh, unit deficit. We will need another million and a half units to 2025. So that's the thing that the governor has been talking about, three and a half million new units across the state. We're not going to get three and a half million units by 2025. Uh, it's taken us so many years to dig, a, dig this hole, it's going to take many more to dig us out. But we, we at least have some numbers on you know, how, how far behind we are. The implication of this is uneven, obviously, across uh, income groups. Take a look at the lower numbers. I don't know if you, can, you probably can't see it in the back, uh, but essentially what it says, the second to last column here, I'll use my little pointer. Uh, if you look here, these three numbers here, it says percentage unable to afford housing. What that means is how many people are, are, are spending more than 30% of their uh, income on housing. That is deemed to be the affordability uh, benchmark. Anyone that's low income, very low income, extremely low income, and low basically means you earn half the median income of the area or less. Almost 100% of those folks are spending more than 30%. And 
And, and extremely, this one says percentage, extremely unable to afford housing. That basically means they're spending more than half their income on housing. So anyone that is earning 30% or less of the area median income, 100% of households in the state are spending 50% or more of their income on housing. That is a huge problem, right? So this is the context in the statewide situation that we, that we face. So, you know, I've proposed that maybe we change our state motto to, from Eureka to the rents too damn high. Um, might start to get people to understand that this is a problem for folks. Uh, you know, we have, I mean, it, you just look at it, it's sort of a, uh, it's an economic argument as well as a justice one. $140 billion of lost economic output per year. If people are spending so much on housing, it just is not a sustainable situation. So he, taking a, a snapshot locally, you know, here are sort of housing units permitted here, Santa Barbara County. Uh, you know, across the county, Santa Maria and, and Santa Barbara. Here's one of the situations we find ourselves in here, which is the South Coast is much more expensive than North Santa Barbara County and much more expensive than the yellow line, which is Ventura County. So what do people do? People live in Oxnard and they drive to Santa Barbara, right? And I was always amazed, you know, when I came up here, and I'd be like, oh, it's gonna be easy, I can get home. <laughs> I was amazed, I mean, it's like Los Angeles. You're just sitting on the freeway and it's, it, you don't quite understand why until you realize that there are a lot of people that aren't living in the city. They're living very far away and they're driving in. And this is backed up by the numbers. So this is, this is not even up to date. This is from 2000 to 2010, but you can see an increase by 31% of uh, commuters to Santa Barbara from uh, Ventura County, and likewise for the, from Northern County. So this is a, an issue. So we're probably up to around 20, 000, almost 20,000 people driving into the city, net difference. And you see this in the traffic counts. So here's 1970. This is on the border of Ventura and Santa Barbara counties, taking traffic counts. You can see back in 1970, not too many people, not too much cars. From 1970 to 2010, there's been a 171% increase in the traffic at the border. Not necessarily even, it's even worse probably as you get closer to the city. So this just demonstrates that point that we are relying on someone else to provide the housing for the workers here in Santa Barbara. And that causes a number of challenges for us. One of them I would argue, and some people will say, you know, the struggles we've seen here on downtown State Street are to do with online sales, and I'm gonna make the argument that that's largely not the case. Uh, I'm gonna make the argument that essentially what we're doing is we're taking the people that would be our consumer base for this area of the city, but they don't live here anymore. They live in Oxnard, and when they get done work, they're not gonna hang around downtown, they're gonna get in their car and go home because it's gonna take far enough, long enough time to get home as it is. So this is one of the challenges, and so what we need to do, part of the rationale for creating more housing in the core of the city is to create a community here, to create people that are going to, to uh, go to local businesses that are going to actually become the center of this town. So that's part of the argument. And I'm not gonna talk a lot about this, but I just wanted to throw this up just to, to kind of highlight, what does it mean if the workers of your town don't live in your town? It means that a lot of the kind of social connections that often got made historically are starting to fray. And you see both on the left and the right, two different perspectives on the idea that you know, the social capital of a, of a community starts to erode when people aren't in it together, when people aren't living and working together and building that community together. People are essentially coming in, working, but they actually, their actual community is somewhere else. So that's an issue. So let me talk about 
this idea of complete and inclusive communities a bit. <coughs> Let's just start, here, here we are, here's State Street. The traditional pattern of growth uh, in the United States up until the, essentially the Second World War was incremental, small scale. We built one thing upon the other, and it was largely a grid, mix of uses, all of these things, and you get great environments that way. The, the post-war project, if you will, uh, of what we call Euclidean zoning, which is basically take the constituent parts of a city and split them up into different areas. Uh, and that, of course, is predicated on the idea that there's no traffic, right? Unlimited mobility, freedom. So that was kind of the idea, and it was a good theory uh, it didn't play out quite so well. It didn't scale, you could say, the way we thought it might. Um, so what you get is, is communities look like this. Um, this, where is this? It could be anywhere, <laughs> really. I mean, it could, be, it could be parts of Oxnard look like this, right? So, it, which is not to say I don't love Oxnard. Um, but, but we built this whole entirely different way of building cities on the idea that we would just drive from A to B. It's no problem. And that led to every town in America having that, right? You go off the, the freeway, every town has every brand, uh, gas stations, fast food joints, etc. We spent billions upon billions creating new infrastructure which is now falling down and we don't have the fiscal capacity in our cities to actually repair this. So that's a challenge. It created a demand for oil and created a demand to create these kind of landscapes. Um, these are, does anyone know Ed, Edward Bertinsky? He's a photographer, he's a Canadian photographer. Uh, created all these uh, photographs of industrial landscapes. They're quite amazing. And of course, that whole thing creates pollution creates CO2, and this is a big challenge in this state. So these were the choices that we made. We build a different kind of city, and part of the uh, argument that I'm making and part of the project of planning today is to actually, in some ways, undo the damage that we did over the last 70 years. And so one of the concepts here of uh, creating complete immunities, which is really about making sure that people can live, work, play, uh, all in the same place, that so you don't have to get in your car to do everything. That's not to say that people are always going to live and work in the same place, but as it turns out, about 80% of car trips are actually not work-related. They're convenience trips. They're, they're going to drop off dry cleaning or pick up a quart of milk, all these things. And so we're not going to deal, it's going to be really tough to deal with the 20% of peak, what we call peak traffic, but we can certainly do something about the other 80%. So, complete communities, what I'm basically gonna present to you here is the idea that what we really ought to be doing in downtown Santa Barbara is to be thinking about what it would it take to create a complete community. How many people need to live here? What kind of services? What is a complete community? It looks something like this, where you have a mix of parks, you have in institutions, you have housing, you have retail, you have offices, all mixed in. And the thing about it is, for all the controversy around you know, producing more density in Santa Barbara, what makes Santa Barbara unique relative to the rest of Southern California is its density. It's it's actually much more dense than the suburban landscape that we've built around it. And that creates value. So we should not see that as a negative, it's actually a, a positive to create value. But what we haven't done a good job over the last 70 years is create so-called missing middle housing. So we, we're generally pretty good at least in very hyper-urban areas uh, in Los Angeles and San Francisco of creating really tall urban buildings. We are very good at creating single family and we're not very good at creating anything in between. And that's what we have to change because that's gonna be the most sustainable way to, to move forward. 
So I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, Calthorpe Analytics did a, a study a number of years ago called Vision California. And what they did is they, they basically modeled across the whole state what would it look like if we just did what we've been doing for 70 years in terms of building it out and comparing and what they, they call that either standard or sprawl, that's on the left, it's kind of like San Ramon in the Bay Area versus something that they call compact, which is kind of like, uh, well, does anybody know Rock Ridge in the Bay Area? It's kind of a, yeah, yeah. Nothing is over three stories in Rock Ridge, but it's got all these great little shops. And it's, so it's not hyper urban, it's just more compact. Versus San Francisco densities. <coughs> San Francisco is, is not a hugely uh, dense city. It's about one third the dense density of Paris. Uh, but for, for us here in California, that's, that's pretty dense. So what they did is they said, well, what happens, what would be the differences on all these different metrics if we actually changed our land use pattern to become uh, a little bit more compact? We would generate more revenue and value. We would have more walkable communities. We would drive less, we would consume less land, and most importantly, perhaps, we would generate less uh, carbon dioxide. So what they said is, okay, this is what we've been doing. 70% of what we've been building has been what they call standard or, or sprawl, quote unquote. What if we change the pattern to, to be primarily compact? How much would, and that's the mix. It's not saying it's 100%, there's still some, some Greenfield development, there's some urban stuff, but most of it is that middle density. What would, how would that impact some of the, these things on an environmental basis across the state? You can see, it has a huge impact in terms of reduction of greenhouse gases. But what does that mean? That means that if you are an environmentalist, what is one of the things that you can do to cut greenhouse gases. You can support compact development, right? That would be huge. I mean, th this is an enormous reduction in greenhouse gases. You, we would drive quite a bit less, like 10,000, the average household would, would drive 10,000 miles less per year if we built out that sort of middle compact scenario that they talked about. we would use way less energy from 74 to 58. We would use way less water, which is key in this state, right? So for all these environmental reasons, doing urban housing, doing compact development, building complete and inclusive communities is a huge environmental win for us. And we're not, to be blunt, we're not gonna meet our greenhouse gas targets without doing this. It's just not going to happen. <coughs> the other thing is, it's actually good for households as well because it, it saves them less money. So we talk about affordable housing, what we should be really talking about is affordable living, which is if we live in places that cost us less uh, to, to, to live, then that's going to keep more money in the pockets of, of families. So this model, this more compact model, would generate savings of about $10,000 per year on average. That's huge. It would cost us much less in infrastructure, about $30 billion a year. <clears throat> Operating uh, costs for public works projects would go down. And more, most importantly, I think, for cities and for counties, it would generate more revenue. More compact development generates more revenue per acre of land, and therefore is a plus. So anybody know Strong Towns? Anybody seen this website? Go out and Google it, look at it. There's a lot of great articles there, but one of the central ideas behind the Strong Towns movement is the idea that the suburban project is essentially um, fiscally insolvent, that you build infrastructure that the, the tax revenue generated by what you build on it, like these single family houses on very big lots, 
doesn't generate enough revenue to actually pay the ongoing costs of just maintaining it. So they, they do this little calculation. They say, well, okay, it's, the life expectancy of that street is about five to seven years before you have to resurface it, right? Um, not all the way to the bottom, but topping. Uh, but they calculated based on the amount of tax that you would generate, it would take almost 17 years to pay for that. And that assumes that 100% of that tax money is going into those infrastructure projects. That's crazy, right? I mean, so what happens, and, and Bill Fulton talked about this in Venture Accounting as, tr as chasing revenue. You have to approve the next suburban development just to cash flow the debt that you've just taken on in the last one. And so it leads to this constant cycle. It's a bit of a problem, right? <coughs> so this is a, an interesting diagram. This is not a super, super high rise. That, that could be like Dubai, right? Um, this is actually a uh, map or a diagram of a town in North Carolina uh, that talks about tax yield, which is the, the amount of tax revenue generated per acre. So what do you see here? The center of the city is generating massive amounts of revenue. The outer areas, not so much. And so they actually went through and they looked on kind of individual parcel basis. And the thing that we said, oh, this is all modern and new, it's great, all these shopping centers, who wants to be downtown in those old buildings, right? Well, these things don't generate that much revenue for the cities. So, you know, it generates 380,000 uh, per acre or 900 for Walmart. And here was little, little Jimmy's Pizza. $3.4 million per acre. I mean, what does that mean? It means that if you build a walkable, compact city, it doesn't matter if your, your Jimmy's Pizza House is beautiful. It, it, the form, the urban form actually generates more value. And then if you start to put houses on top of Jimmy's Pizza, then it gets even more. So, so there's a very strong fiscal argument to doing this, right? And so this, was, this is stuff that I pulled when I was up in Calgary on the Planning Commission, and we, we asked them to do an analysis to see, you know, what was the tax yield of just looking at some of these different types. Single, and I just pulled out two here. Single family detached was about $11,000 per acre if you did nothing else but allowed buildings to touch, i.e. townhouses, you would get 50% more tax yield off of it. So imagine the fiscal capacity of your town or your county if we did more compact development. So that's kind of the argument there. Okay. So if it's so obvious to do this, why don't we do it, right? <clears throat> so we have a problem with parking. I'll talk about that. Construction costs, impact fees, zoning, community opposition, CEQA abuse. I, I stopped there because I ran out of space, but I could have gone on. Um, there's lots of reasons. It's challenging because the whole system is set up to do the opposite. The whole system post-war is to set up to build out, not to build in. Um, I thought I would just point out Los Angeles. Everybody likes to pick on Los Angeles. It's easy to pick on Los Angeles. Los Angeles uh, has over 100 square miles of surface parking. Santa Barbara is 20 square miles, right? So surface parking, there's five times more surface parking in Los Angeles than Santa Barbara exists, right? San Francisco is about two and a half. So it's all of the land in Manhattan. Now think of the fiscal capacity of Manhattan compared to surface parking lots. So uh, the point here is that Los Angeles actually builds too much parking. And in fact, almost every city in the state builds too much parking. And by too much, I mean it literally is not needed. Like, it's not. So you have a, a San, I like to compare like a San Francisco, that's sort of a typical, you know, surface parking here in yellow versus an Indianapolis. I, anybody here from Indianapolis? Oh, good. See, that's why I picked Indianapolis. I knew nobody would be from Indianapolis. I mean, what happens when you build like your downtown is sort of 50% surface parking, right? I mean, is that a place you want to be? Is that generating value? 
is not. So here's an interesting thing. Two parking spaces with a little bit of uh, drive aisle is about the same area as a very compact, what we call efficiency, sort of a studio kind of building, uh, apartment. So what do you want to do? Do you want to build more parking or do you want to house people? Because that's, at the end of the day, really the choice. And the question is, is that parking needed? You know, you might think to myself, well, I've got this, I've got a three-car garage, I've got lots, lots of cars. But it turns out that not everybody does. And even in Los Angeles, so Los Angeles requires two and a half parking spaces per unit, or two and a quarter for rental if it's a two-bedroom. There are certain provisions in the core of the city that are different, but the actual car ownership of the city is one point, around 1.6, and one in eight have no car. So you literally have a requir parking requirement that is 40 to 60% higher than what is actually needed. It, that becomes even more extreme in the central areas that are actually serviced by transit, where people don't have 1.6 cars. So we have, to, we have to understand that, that what we do, and there's studies that do this. You go at 3 o'clock in the morning, and you count the number of cars in the garages, and you find that there's 40% vacant spaces. Why are, we, why are we making developers build 40% vacant spaces instead of building more housing for people? So that's kind of, it's just logical. It's not, it's not a radi radical idea. Why is, it, why is it bad to have more, oh, too much parking? Because as it turns out, it costs a lot of money. It adds a lot of money to the, the development costs. Uh, in, La, in, in San Francisco, it costs something on the order of $80,000 to build a structured parking space. I mean, that's crazy, right? It's not that in Los Angeles, but you know, the, somebody had calculated it average, on average nationally, not even in the high cost coastal cities, nationally it adds $225 a month to rent. So we have to ask ourselves, what, what's, what are we trying to solve here? Another problem we have is construction costs are skyrocketing. From 2014 to 2000, the last five years nationally, uh, construction costs have gone up 28%. And I can guarantee you in the expensive coastal areas, it's much higher than that. Uh, but that's not a sustainable rate. We can't increase by that amount. Look at San Francisco. So this is just what we call hard costs, which is just to build the thing. It doesn't include the cost of land, doesn't include all the impact fees or you know architect's fees, what we call soft costs, all of these things. Just the hard costs. $520 a square foot. That means that it's $500,000 to build a 1,000 square foot unit before anything else, before land, before saw cost, before profit, any of that. So that's crazy, right? I mean, this is really expensive. And part of the reason is we don't have the labor in the construction industry anymore. What happened in the, in the Great Recession is a lot of people decided that was a good time to retire and they didn't come back. And young people have not gone into construction. Doesn't look like an appealing industry for them. So we have this, you can see, from a low in 2009 of about 25,000 unfilled jobs, it's 10 times that today. So we just don't have the labor. Uh, I will just make a point that fees add a huge amount as well. And this is a Prop 13 thing. We, we need the money, so we tack on a lot of fees. Uh, and you can see in some cases how much that costs. It's $150,000 in some cases adding to the cost of every unit. That increases the cost of housing. I should throw this up here just to show how sensitive development is. If you hold everything else constant, if you just ha increase the fees, city fees from 60000 to 80000 you add a 10% increase in construction costs, that project goes from being, being marginally viable to being not viable. So everybody always thinks developers are making tons of money. You know, their investors probably are, but the developers aren't usually making that much money. So we have to, we have to understand what's actually feasible to build. But the, the net result is that we have this kind of weird bookend where we can, we can build as much expensive housing as we need, 
and we have subsidy for low-income housing, but we have no way to build the missing middle. There's not enough, there's, subsidies don't count for that, and they don't economically pencil. It's a challenge. So what do we can do to build this kind of complete community, this inclusive community? I would say it actually starts with the public realm, creating complete streets. You can see some of the, some of the things that are necessary there. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Lancaster's, um, Lancaster Boulevard, what they did there? This was a typical car-oriented street in a really declining downtown. What they did is they essentially ripped it out and they rebuilt it. They built it as a kind of ramblas, right? With the, you know, stuff going down the middle, you know. And this is a pretty sleepy town. Anybody from Lancaster? Yeah. So is this successful? Hmm. <laughs> well, they say it is. <laughs> <laughs> so it cost $11.5 million, it generated $130 million and $270 million economic output. And you can see some of the other things in terms of jobs, in terms of tax revenues, in terms of uh, you know, pedestrian injuries, all of these kind of benefits to investing in the public realm. And it looks like this. So that's what it used to look like. You put in this paving in the middle. Note that there's actually parking here, that this convertible into something else put in some, some lighting and some trees, some development on the side. Yes, you get parking sometimes, and it can be converted into farmer's markets and, and other things. This is really inexpensive to do, and the economic benefits are huge. So I decided to look at uh, our down here. I, illustrative only, very key point. Because uh, I know somebody's like, that's my parking lot, what are you talking about? So we've got, one of the things that struck me in coming here all the time is like, I, I'm on State Street, this beautiful street, I go in behind, it's like, whoa, there's like tons of surface parking, it's like Jekyll and Hyde, in terms of the public realm. So it seems to me that there is an opportunity in the core of the city to take what is, you know, the land value is quite high, and it's, it's, be, it's these are cash cows, and they're necessary in some ways to support the businesses, but we can be, do this more efficiently. We can take these areas like this and turn them into stuff like this. Note what happens here is you're not getting rid of parking, actually. You're structuring it in a different way. So you have, he, see here in the middle, uh, there's a structured parking lot, and you wrap it with housing and other services at the ground floor. It creates tremendous value uh, and yet still provides the convenience of, uh, of the car for people to come downtown. So you take these landscapes and they ultimately turn into very interesting landscapes. I wanted to bring this up. This will be the most scary part for you because uh, I'm referencing a city that's 1.3 million, so it's going to be a little weird. But So this was something we did when I was on the commission on, in Calgary. We, there was this idea that the community had self-determined that they wanted to do all these parks and they didn't have any money to pay for it. So we created this thing called a community amenity fund. And instead of thinking of density as sort of like there's a magic number, right? You go to these planning commission, or you go to these, you know, here are these meetings about projects and you see and oh no, it can't be more than, you know, 40 feet. 42 feet, no possible way. 40 feet, okay, because that's what it says. What we, what we understood is that there's actually a range that sort of looks and feels right. You don't want something that's massively out of scale, and there's some areas that it actually looks worse if it's lower. So there's a kind of base level, and there's a maximum level, and we created that. And then what we said is, if a developer wanted to go over the base level, they could do that, but they actually had to make a contribution, not to the city, but to the local community amenity fund. So, this was self-determined by the local community, and it was, a it was a source of revenue for them to uh, build, in this case, parks, but in other cases, it might be childcare spaces or affordable housing or whatever it is. So it's a model. It's just a model that is a, a workable way to, to you know, generate community benefit. Because I think that's one of the challenges that people have is that they see all this new development and they, they only see the negatives. They only see, oh, there's more traffic. They don't see the positive. They don't see that there's a direct benefit to their community. 
So this was a way to, to actually incentivize local communities to actually want to see new growth. And it was actually very successful. Uh, and, and, you know, it had a kind of system where you could go up to a certain maximum. Uh, this is the scary image. Whoa, huge. This is a big city. But it doesn't need to look like that. It doesn't need to be that big. But the idea is that you have this mechanism by which developers have a certainty. They, can, they know how much it's going to cost. They can underwrite that into their projects. And the community has a benefit in it because they're actually going to get funding to do things that are of local import to them. So it actually is a very interesting model. The other thing I just wanted to mention is density. This picture in the background is, is one of the original garden cities upon which our suburbs were based, only we made it much less dense. Uh, 12 units per acre, uh, we build at something like three. Right. Um, people really have struggled with this idea of density. How big is this? So I thought I'd put some numbers on it. Upper East Side in New York is basically 10 times that. Okay, 10 times that original garden city in density. 118,000 people versus 19,000 people. LA, uh, Koreatown is one of the more dense parts of LA, that's 42,000. And here's uh, Oak Park is 12,000 here in Santa Barbara. So what I pulled here, and this is kind of arbitrary, this is being, looking at the data, because <laughs> that's what I could get. Uh, in this 28 block area, according to the numbers, 816 people live here. And that works out to about 3,000 people per square mile, okay? So that's quite a bit less than even Oak Park. What would it mean if you wanted to get up to Oak Park type density? You would have to add about 3,000 people or 24, 2,500 units. That sounds big, right? 2,500 units, wow. Okay. Or 2,500 people, that's about 1,200 units. But here you have like 10, you know, surface parking lots you need a 1,200 units, that's about 120 per, per surface parking lot. So is that doable in Santa Barbara type scale? Do you want, because that's the thing, like nobody envisions high rises here, right? That's not what we want. And so what I did is I just pulled some examples of, of projects that are at that density. Uh, they're all kind of new urbanist uh, projects all by the same firm. Amulin Polizoides in Pasadena. Here's Granada Court. You can see two courtyards in the middle. This is what it looks like. Can you see that? Is that, could that be built in Santa Barbara? It's not, not too scary. Okay, is that, is that okay? It's pretty nice, pretty nice stuff. Pretty dense too, right? You, and it's, 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 architecturally consistent with what we have here in Santa Barbara, but it's also uh, getting us towards that complete and inclusive community. Here's another one. This one happens to be in West Hollywood, but looks like this, or like this. Not so bad. Um, here's another one in Rolling Hills Estate, so you can even do it in the suburbs if you want. So it looks kind of like that. I just throw those in there to show you that density doesn't have to look bad. It can look pretty good. The other thing I want to show you here, we had a team that won a competition at the, uh, uh, in, in Chicago, at the Kellogg Real Estate Venture Competition. And it, the basis of this was that there's all this empty storefronts. What are we going to do with all these empty storefronts? And they proposed this project called Click and Mortar. They won, yay. Um, what's interesting here is as growth in online shopping has expanded, what's interesting is that overall, in-store shopping hasn't actually gone down. It has gone down in certain kinds of retail environments, typically the kind of big indoor regional malls. And that's because people want, if they're gonna do shopping in person, they want a kind of experience. And State Street is that experience. I mean, other cities are trying to recreate something that looks like State Street. If you go to Los Angeles, uh, in Glendale, you've got Americana brand, you've got The Grove. 
They're trying to recreate what looks like a, an early 20th century streetscape because that is something that people want to be in. So I think that if we can think of the strategies to reoccupy these empty storefronts, so what they, their model was, create a series of lockers, create a series of kit of parts, essentially, that can be popped into these retail spaces. And people will go, they'll order their Amazon, they'll go pick it up at these re lockers, and as they walk by, they might actually pick up something else. And it turns out this idea of the omni-channel retail environment is actually very successful. So that was kind of their idea. So you have this much more flexible space and micro retailing combined with lockers is a way to take underutilized retail space on streets like State Street and reuse it. There's other things that are coming down the pipeline and already here, shared housing, hybrid ownership models. Uh, and then up, up in the Bay Area, at least, we have uh, off-site construction becoming much more common with factory OS. This is a way to try to keep you know, really tackle that problem of construction costs. So that's basically what I wanted to do. I did want to leave you with this, which is the idea that cities evolve and change. And that's a natural thing. Here's Santa Barbara, here's State Street in 1874, you know, Western Frontier, uh, 1908. You can see this, you know, some of these buildings, and this is the way that cities used to build, right? Some of these buildings here, one-story buildings, note that this three-story building next door, suddenly you get you know, a, a taller building coming in next to it. Perfectly great uh, Victorian city, right? And then, of course, the earthquake comes, and then we rebuild the city as a kind of Spanish colonial city. That was kind of invented, right? I mean, the, the, the idea that you know, things don't change in cities is something that I think we all have to understand that they do evolve, just like all of us. Time doesn't stand still. It doesn't have to be a bad thing. We just have to manage it in a way that maximizes the benefits and minimizes the negative stuff. And that's, that's really our job, uh, to evolve our communities, to make sure that we do b build those complete communities. And so even if you look back, I mean, the areas that are off of State Street used to be more dense than they are now before we ripped stuff down and put surface parking lots. So basically what I'm saying is the materials to rebuild these areas, we, are, we don't have to look outside of Santa Barbara. We already have all of the, the materials here. And I just leave this image there because I think it just captures what Santa Barbara is all about. It's, it's actually really dense, these paseos, uh, walkable community, mixed use. Santa Barbara was actually way ahead of the curve. And it's time that we just get back to what we used to do. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Morrow. B before we get into the Q&A panel, our next speaker will also provide us with the local perspective. Nina Johnson is a senior assistant to the city administrator at the city of Santa Barbara. With over 20 years of experience bringing an entrepreneurial approach to local government issues, she has led organization-wide programs in the areas of economic vitality, sustainability, communication, and performance management. She has a master's degree in urban planning at UCLA and a bachelor's degree in public administration from Drake University. Please join me in welcoming Nina. Thank you. I uh, just wanted to say a few words, and uh, we have a currently, we're looking at our staff group. Raise your hand. I see Dan, and Jessica is behind here, and Rosie here. Uh, our city is looking at making some changes to our average unit density program, and. We've had a few very long hearings with our planning commission and getting a lot of really good comments. We encourage everyone to get, a, get involved and uh, send council some comments and ideas about what you'd like to see. On November 14th, uh, council and the planning commission will be holding a joint meeting uh, in the morning to discuss uh, the program changes. So we just wanted to sh share with you that information. And you can leave it on, too. Thanks. 
Our final part of the program will consist of an opportunity for you to ask questions to our experts. Our moderator for our panel is Historic Landmarks Commissioner Anthony Grumbine. He is currently a principal at Harrison Design and a board member for the Santa Barbara Trust for Historic Preservation. As an accomplished artist in watercolor rendering and arch architectural drawings, he regularly contributes to a number of local publications. He received his master's in architecture from the University of Notre Dame and bachelor's in architecture from Carleton University. Anthony, the floor is yours, and if we can all move to the middle here. All right, well, thank you. All right, so um, just wanted to first briefly uh, introduce our, our, our panel here. Um, so Nina Johnson um, is, is our expert from the city, our expert witness. Uh, we have Peter Lewis, who's, who's playing the part of a developer tonight. Um, and, and, as John, and John Campanella as our planning commissioner. All right, so to start with, I had a question for Nina. Um, so uh, what are the opportunities for housing downtown and the commercial areas? And then I'm going to have a follow-up question with, for Greg on, on that matter as well. This is really a tremendous time of opportunity. We're seeing an intersection of two major real estate trends with a, a lot of retail space. We've got an excess retail space, not enough housing units for a diverse community. Um, we're seeing with the rise of online shopping, we're seeing a lot more vacancies with our large buildings. And uh, in terms of the retail spaces, some of the smaller spaces, retails may not be going away, but the size, the, the footprint is shrinking. So we've got a lot of excess retail space, and this is a chance for us to repurpose a lot of this excess space uh, with housing, a, a wide range of housing options. Uh, a really good opportunity for us. Our architects, I see a number of them in the room. A couple years ago, they did a charrette where they identified our, uh, some opportunities, went block by block examining where could we build housing, and they identified our city lots uh, above and behind units because we have a lot of long, deep spaces. So we have a lot of uh, work started, and now we really need, just need to keep it going. All right, so the follow-up for Greg is, um, so, uh, and you touched on this a little bit in your presentation as well, but if you can go into a little more detail um, on sort of some of uh, the opportunity and challenges that Santa Barbara faces comparing to the other places that you've studied and, and looked at, um, how are things different here or the same, um, how are, and you touched on one of the, you know, one of the innovative possible solutions, but how, how are other cities kind of dealing with a similar type of um, issue? Well, I think Santa Barbara's challenge is is about job growth in a sense. It's like where the, where's the demand coming from? I mean, it's always uh, it's always interesting to say you need to build housing, but what you actually need to do is build these complete communities. You need to build enough jobs that are near the housing. So what we see in other cities is just that the scale of it is much quicker and faster. I think that the pace of change here doesn't need to be so radical. So I think that there's an opportunity to step back and figure out how to, how to do it architecturally well, uh, not be afraid of that density, not be afraid to build on some of these uh, underutilized retail, uh, you know, department store type of spaces that are typically what's going vacant. Um, so other communities are very much doing this. This is the, the thing. It's just that they don't do it as well because they're trying to do it much more quickly than I think that you guys can do. Darn HLC. Um, okay, so for, uh, for Peter, um, so, um, so you're a, a, as a developer in Santa Barbara for a number of years. Um, so in, in conversations with you, um, you said that you know, a lot of projects aren't penciling right now. So in your opinion, what are the factors that are both within the city's control and outside of the city's control uh, that are keeping housing from penciling? And then as a follow-up, Greg, um, based on your research, um, uh, how have these types of challenges been handled by other cities as well? So I think the, 
The thing that the city's doing currently that um, are barriers to developers like myself is that uh, the, the entitlement process is lengthy, so whatever ways we can we can uh, shorten that will uh, will help and make a difference to anybody that's considering uh, developing. Uh, currently, I always consider the entitlement process to take at least a year, um, but you do see projects that take multiple years and uh, it could be a number of reasons but we have a lengthy development process and we have a risky development process um, and Greg did a really good job I mean uh, pinpointing all the reasons that it's expensive in this town are just heightened all those graphs are just multiplied by a, a little bit more here for um, the reasons that he was citing but the, the risky the risk to it is um, if you think it's going to be a long time and then the city itself will uh, allow appeals to come through and, in fact, um, let the appeals prevail, it really scares developers as well. So this is something in their control where the government, and this is not the planning department, but the city council itself uh, can, can um, cause concern amongst the development community. Uh, and then the, the other thing that the city's doing right now is that it has a building department that is, continues to be a very lengthy process. Typically, one year after you've entitled the project and you have your completed documents and you've submitted to the city, you're going to be lucky to get a permit in 12 months. That's not typical of most municipalities that I've worked with, and that just needs to be addressed. And lastly, I would say the thing that they're not doing right now that would make a difference is get a development director who has authority that can help move some of these things through the process. And they will have the, uh, the political capital to help move some of these things that get impinged at various different friction points. It's an interesting one. I mean, everybody, uh, every developer always thinks it, it's too slow. And that's true. Uh, in, La, in San Francisco, it's, one year would be like a miracle, right? So, but the fact that, that it's slow in a city that is, you know, it's not a huge city, right? I mean, it's not San Francisco, it's not Los Angeles. So there, there has to be a way to create more predictability, because I think that's what developers are looking for, is they need to know, is this gonna take X amount of time? That's fine, I know that, I can underwrite it, but if it starts to becoming more than what is predicted, then that's just more money that, that comes out of the project, and that just means that you're gonna have to uh, charge higher rents to basically recover that to the extent you can. Um, you know, you can create, in, I mean, I'm a fan of kind of incentivizing developers. I mean, it's a kind of uh, back and forth. You know, you want affordable housing, uh, but provide some density bonus to do that with. It doesn't have to be huge, but it does have to be, there have to be some way uh, for those projects to pencil. And one of the things that's happened in Los Angeles, for example, is they've created these transit oriented community uh, bonuses that have been hugely effective in generating not just more housing generally, but more affordable housing. Um, and so you could look at some, some kind of system like that. It doesn't have to be at the same scale. Um, I think those kind of things, even as something as simple as, you know, having a system online that allows you to enter your project, all the square footage is, it, it cranks out how much uh, everything is gonna cost, how long it's going to, take, you know, those, those, those kind of things that make it predictable uh, are really going to be helpful to, to keep costs down. Because I, I think that's the really important point here is that it's not for the benefit of the developer. It, it does benefit the developer, but it's, it's because if you just make it longer, harder, more difficult, more onerous, it just creates more expensive housing. And that is contrary to what we're trying to do. All right, um, so I'll hit you with a really easy one. Uh, will tonight's presentation be made available online? Thank you.
<laughs> all right, that was easy. Um, all right, and then to what extent uh, will the new state ADU requirements expand, expand housing capacity? And um, maybe if, uh, if you can throw in your two cents and also maybe Nina, if there is any additional thing that you wanna add. Well, I mean, it's kind of invisible density in a sense, right? It's literally in your backyard, it's in, in part of your house that already exists. Uh, it's what we call gentle density. Um, so I think it's going to have a big effect. Uh, it could have a big effect. Uh, it depends on, you know, homeowners being able to, to access this. I think there's, you're going to see some um, help come your way, essentially. There's companies now that are, are trying to help homeowners be able to create these, because that's traditionally been the, developer, been the developer's job, right? Like a homeowner is not really a developer. so. How do you know how to do it? You know, it costs money to do the design, all of these things. So I think it, it has a huge upside, uh, but we haven't yet seen what that's gonna be like. I know in the city of LA, it's, we've seen something like a thousand percent increase in ADU applications since the new state ADU laws came in. So it creates a more consistent uh, approach across the state. I think it's, this is a really good area for us to be looking at our full toolkit for a wide range of housing options, whether it's ADUs, whether we're looking at our commercial areas in downtown, we need to be looking at different tools, different strategies to meet different housing needs. And if we can look at, and we, the state is generating a lot of tools for us, they just, the governor just signed so many bills a couple of weeks ago. If we can be looking at how to implement those in a way and take an approach that works for Santa Barbara, it's appropriate for different sites, and we can be creative in how we implement it, uh, we can make it work. All right, so sort of to tie to that as well, for, with the same three letters but in different order, AUD. Um, so uh, this, and this one uh, is for Greg and then John. Um, so. In big, broad brush strokes, uh, please discuss how various other municipalities are addressing their larger housing needs. We just, you just touched on the ADU, but uh, we have a program here, the AUD, um, which will fold over to John's uh, commentary. As, so as a planning commissioner, John, you are currently in the middle of reviewing an AUD program. Um, what are the current rules of AUD, FAR, parking, et cetera, and in your opinion, what needs to be done short-term and long-term to address the future housing of Santa Barbara in particular? So. Well, I mean, one thing that has been interesting in Los Angeles, uh, and I, I hate to use Los Angeles, it's like a bad word, uh, but it's, I know. Uh, I, I, but I think there's some aspects that they're doing pretty well. And there's one thing that they have created called a small lot ordinance, which allows you to build a freehold very small uh, homes that are, in theory, uh, more affordable than uh, larger homes. Uh, but the key thing is that they're freehold. And that makes it easier for developers to build uh, and architects to design. Any architect in the room would know that condos create all sorts of liability issues. So it's, it's been a huge plus. So, and in fact, uh, Pearl Chase back in 1926 was talking about small homes in Santa Barbara. So, you know, it's, it's a natural. Uh, thank you, John Campanella. Uh, I just want to backtrack one second, and we have staff here from the city. In the last couple of weeks, there's actually new laws, uh, bills that have come out, uh, modifying laws for the ADUs. And there's a lot more flexibility that's provided uh, to the owner. If you were interested in such a program, but there were some drawbacks that you saw relative to what's allowed, those drawbacks may have been relieved. Uh, I believe it's also on uh, occupancy by an owner, uh, ownership, other issues that may have prevented you from going forward. Uh, I think those have been alleviated, at least for some period of time as a test. So I would go to the city, to the counter, see who is in charge of knowing what's currently going on, and see now if you'd like to apply. And that's recently, the last couple of weeks. Okay. Uh, as far as the ADU program, uh, it's, it was, it's a test. 
as everyone knows, and that test uh, will run out when there's 250 units of our highest density completed. And it looks like that's going to occur at the end of uh, next year, 2020. Uh, the program was designed to uh, produce apartments, rentals, uh, and under the program, I believe 97% of the units that are being processed are rentals. For sale is allowed, but people have opted to do the rental program. So that's an observation, but it's, it's really there. Uh, the other thing was we were looking for lower, smaller square footages to make things more affordable. Uh, prior to the AUD, uh, condos were being built that averaged around 1,500 square feet, plus a two-car garage. So the AUD units are averaging 750 square feet, uh, half the size, and they have half the parking requirement. So that's resulted in more moderate construction. Actually, construction in buildings that almost resemble what was being produced uh, for luxury condos. Uh, the uh, couple more points, we're trying to balance housing and jobs. The projects uh, that are in process or with a building, getting a building permit, real projects, are taking, removing about 73,000 square feet of commercial, old commercial property that have, could have been regenerated for more jobs. The uh, Sachs building that uh, uh, Amazon is going into, uh, I believe is about 42,000 square feet. They're looking at about 300 jobs. So you can tell part of the positive impact if you're trying to balance that's occurred by this program. Uh, the last point is half of the units that are being produced by the trial formerly were on sites that were formerly being processed for condominiums. So the owners felt it was better to go apartments. There was enough incentive provided at the time to, uh, to do that. Where we are, as, as Nina mentioned, we're looking at making revisions to the program so it doesn't run out before we fine tune it relative to parking, open space that's required. But there's been a good deal of uncertainty over the last couple of years on whether someone can start processing and actually get approved. That's just people beyond downtown, not counting the downtown people who have tenants or alternate uses of the property. So hopefully uh, we get going with our meeting on the 14th where we start to look at how do we convince people that they can proceed and make applications. Because in the last two years, we've gone from about 200 units application under the AUD high density program a year in 15 and 16 down to 117, 18, or 19 units. This year to date are three units. So something is dissuading. It's cost uncertainty. But certainly it's going to be our job to get that going again. Otherwise, we're never going to be able to reach any housing, rental housing that we need. All right. Thank you. Um, OK, so uh, for this one, is just, just for Dr. Morrow, can you share examples from other cities who have had a, a parking minimums for urban development that found a way to use that opportunity and savings um, from not building parking to reinvest in robust transit service to serve the new dense urban community? Yeah, I mean, it's really about actually eliminating parking minimums. Um, most cities that have, that have done that have been able to right size their parking requirements. It doesn't mean that you're not going to get parking. It means that the parking is going to be based on what the market determines. The best examples are where you are adding density, lowering parking, and doing some sort of value capture that then gets reinvested into the transit system. And we had a little bit of that actually up in Calgary um, where you, there was a lot more flexibility actually. So for example, you could, um, you could get a, you could actually request a zero parking. We actually approved a zero parking tower. It would be your nightmare. Uh, but it was right next to um, a transit station, but it was also interesting because what they had to do for the guest spaces, they actually had to essentially make a contribution to the parking authority to be able to use shared parking as a approach. So it, basically they entered an agreement with the parking authority to take so many spaces of a nearby garage that were underutilized at night that would otherwise just be sitting vacant 
why would they make them put it on site if you can have an agreement to use underutilized space that's you know a block away? So that's a, that's a very common thing that you see in other places that works very well, totally logical. Uh, and again, if you think about it as a, not a giveaway to developers, but as a way to keep the costs down, then you'll see that that's really good. Like up there, those units in that zero parking tower, so they start at 199,000 in a market that the average condo was 400,000. So it's a really effective way to get costs down. Thanks. Okay. Um, so one more for you, Mr. Greg. Um, so historic buildings as well as historic urban development patterns are important to many of us in the city of Santa Barbara and are a huge part of the, su the success and the beauty of the city. In some cases of other cities, uh, new development has strongly affected and even ruined wonderful, historic, and very livable portions of the cities. Uh, what strategies have you seen that work well for areas of historically sensitive cities? Well, they can work well or not well, but you know, some cities have historic preservation overlay zones which provide for an extra level of review uh, to ensure you know, materials, scale, massing, orientation. These kind of things are consistent with the area. Um, I think that's good. Um, you know, I think that it really isn't, it doesn't need to be you know, so difficult. You already have design review. Uh, it's really about just understanding, you know, balancing what is feasible economically with what is desirable from an aesthetic point of view. I don't think there's really any inherent conflict between building new projects that ha are consistent with that scale of massing materials. All right, so back to parking. Um, so. Uh, structured parking, even mechanically stacked parking and structures, would cost between sixty to one hundred thousand per space. If the city collects a fee of ten thousand dollars per unit, we would miss the opportunity for market pricing and revenue for low and middle income housing subsidy and inclusions. Question mark. I'm not sure if that's. I, I think that question there is: Should we have a kind of in lieu fee? And generally, I would say no. You should have just lower parking requirements. Uh, that's the answer. Um, there's also sort of, you know, what people are building nowadays is they're building taller parking structures than normal and using stackers to be able to get more in there. Now that doesn't really work for retail things, but it does work for residential. Um, and the idea is that those can be pulled out as demand for parking goes down due to shared, shared uh, car usage and that they can be converted either to more housing or to other offices. So it just depends on, I've seen them work both ways. On a comment on, uh, comment on parking, uh, if you, a current policy which uh, we were looking at, uh, our joint meeting on November 14th with City Council is presenting recommendations uh, to reduce parking requirements uh, within, let's say, Anacapa to uh, uh, Chapala Street uh, downtown, where we're trying to re redo buildings or put new buildings in, but there's really no place to park. Uh, an example that you might look, look at for costs is 634 Anacapa Street, the uh, apartments that are now stuccoed, uh, being built across the street from Paradise Cafe. It's a three-story building. There's only, in total, one floor of apartments. That's because level two and level three is only half built out. The balance is a donut hole in the middle for open area, which goes up two floors. You have a very expensive garage and commercial down below. So effectively, the maximum right now that you could build is about, in the highest density, is maybe one, the same as your lot size. That means one floor in most cases. Across the street is the uh, Anacapa and Ortega garage. There are two floors empty all day long, not counting at night. So to spend the money on garage and not build housing and then have a garage across the street, I think is an example of maybe we have to think a little better on how to get housing downtown. Thank you. Okay, so this is a question for Greg and Nina. Um, 
There's a great need for workplace housing to fill the gap between uh, single family and 100% affordable. What is the best way to address this much needed housing uh, needed for people like nurses, police, fire, and if housing was required to be more efficient, solar, LED lighting, smart heating and cooling, tankless water heaters, et cetera, would that help in bring down the costs, uh, costs down? And then there's a LED certified. I think uh, housing is really such an important component in the conversation of downtown revital revitalization and how we help our local businesses. When I talk to business owners and small, large businesses, the large retailers, uh, all of them, everyone has a single thread, common thread running through uh, that's challenging them. Their employees, how do, we, how do we help them find employees, retain employees? The workforce housing is so important for them. Uh, while I may be going to them to talk about how their sales are doing, they're, ta they're talking about employee turnover and uh, the cost to live here and what are we doing uh, as a community to work on that. So that's a huge challenge facing the business community and if we're focused on uh, the health of our local businesses and how we help them survive, uh, that's a really important component. I think looking at many solutions, types of solutions, we, we were talking about ADUs, uh, we were talking about uh, building more housing units in commercial areas, tackling different solutions, uh, and, and looking at different income levels. We have restaurant owners, the hospitality industry, uh, they're facing a lot of challenges in finding employees. Uh, I know the Housing Authority, we've partnered with them for many decades and they've done some great work looking, uh, looking at projects with them, some creative partnerships to see how we can get uh, more opportunities uh, for those workers. So we really need to look at the full spectrum because it's an issue affecting every business sector. Well, a couple of points. Number one, it's, it's actually hard to, to target particular uh, people due to fair housing laws to say, you know, this housing is for firefighters, this housing is for teachers. Um, we run into issues there. But what I would say is this, in the Bay Area, for example, what's happening is we're just not producing enough housing. And so what happens is people who have means, when they can't even buy housing, they start to move into more modest neighborhoods, buying up houses, fixing them up, gentrifying those neighborhoods, uh, displacing people to other areas far outside the city. So it's, it's not just a question of how do you produce quote unquote workforce housing, it's about producing housing, period. Because if you're not producing housing across the income spectrum, then even people who make tons of money, they're gonna squeeze everybody out and they're gonna move to Oxnard, right? So it's, it's so you have, to, you have to resist the temptation to only target one sector, section of the, of the income spectrum. We know we need that, but you have to look at it as a big picture. You have to look at, you need housing across the, interest, the income spectrum. Thanks. Right. Okay, so this will be, um, I think, probably tie in um, uh, as, as well, um, John, if, if you can answer this as well, but uh, for Greg, start off with. So if the goals, goal of increasing density is to lower the cost of housing. Isn't the regulatory act of changing the density causing the cost of land to increase, sucking up whatever cost benefit there was? Well, it's true that you know if, if you increase the density, it, it, to some extent it gets capitalized in the land, but that's only due to the fact that there's scarcity of it. If you have enough breadth of that increased capacity, you know, then, then you don't see it concentrated. So it's how you do it, it depends, right? If you say, okay, well this one block, we're gonna increase density, then yeah, you're gonna capitalize into the value. But if you have, have a broader strategy of increasing density, then uh, you're not gonna see those spikes, right? And at the end of the day, you're gonna create more housing that's gonna create more tax revenue. So I think you have to look at, again, the big picture Right? Not, not just, there is, that's true to some extent, but only if you are very limited in how you apply that density. 
Actually, I'll add one more question to it before handing it down there for Peter and John. Um, so part of that and then as well, so what are some of the ways that uh, building housing can be accomplished in both the short and long term while still keeping the high quality Santa Barbara feel for the city? So just sort of looking at costs and... and <laughs> well, I think the, uh, you know, that's a, that's the $10,000 question, right? I mean, we, we need the city to maintain um, an environment that incentivizes uh, investment. And so what is, we've had an AUD program that's been somewhat successful, has now entered kind of a controversial moment, and the city's actions to date have actually increased costs uh, to every project. So the inclusionary element, which is kind of a, you know, it, it's politically correct, but frankly, it's, um, it's a dagger in the heart of, of the projects economically. So they've, they've done the absolute opposite of what Greg is talking about. We should be reducing parking, reducing fees, incentivizing people to build this. I mean, his, his graphs are, to me, are just so uh, profound to see how the regulatory environment's done the absolute opposite of what it intended to do, which is to make good housing. Instead, it's produced no housing. And to this date, it produces no housing. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure that that we can do anything to produce it unless we actively encourage housing. And that means we do everything to encourage it and nothing to uh, create disincentives. Okay, uh, thank you. I, I spoke a little bit about, ago about 634 uh, and a Street where the maximum is 100% coverage one time. That's, that's all over town right now for the overlay. But what I don't think we've addressed is you know, what's uh, referred to as the donut hole, which is exactly where we want the housing. The maximum amount of livable, rentable square footage or size on a parcel is about half the parcel size. So if you look at this room, if you wanted to convert this building or something like it to housing, you could only build housing on the second floor, probably to the middle of this area. And that was to protect historical resources when we did the plan. There was enough other areas that would produce housing, but in general, to protect historical resources. We have ways to do that without being on an overall basis. And uh, HLC, our urban historian, there's objective evidence whether something is historical or not and should be uh, not changed or, re or pulled down. And we haven't done any of that in the city. In fact, we've incorporated in a number of projects, actually incorporated and even put in better positions, relocated some historical uh, to look good. But we have this general idea right now that we can encourage people downtown to convert a portion of their property, add on a floor, tear it down and go up, and only get a half a floor residential. So I think it's time that uh, as we go through this process of what do we want to do next, and staff has some great ideas, city staff, about looking at floor area ratios, looking at the buildings, how they relate to each other in a block, opening up blocks. These are all great ideas, but we need to get property owners, architects, land planners involved in that process. So it's up to all of you here and out there that have that role is where we go through the next year or so trying to come up with new ways to get housing downtown, that you participate, you show what works, you bring in examples, and I, I would say start bringing in examples now. Uh, the state allows density bonus and incentives if you do a portion affordable. Come in with some affordable and talk to the city about what you need downtown to make it work. So uh, I think we're encouraged that we're heading in the right direction, but we can't do it without the development community and the landowners. 
this question is, affordable housing models require reasonable economics of scale. In downtown land, land assemblage, is difficult in order to create affordable projects on assembled or redeveloped parcels. Without the authority anymore of an RDA, do you see any models out there for community means to in, uh, encourage and facilitate such redevelopment and evolution? Are you, is that talking about naturally affordable? Uh, well, look, I mean, affordable housing, like if you're talking about set aside coveted projects require subsidy. And, you know, they tend to operate within the kind of 50 to 100 unit range for a reason due to tax credits. But, you know, it is a challenge. It, you just have to have programs in place to be able to incentivize that. I mean, you know, Los Angeles, again, you know, they have tons of money that they're putting into affordable housing. Uh, they work with nonprofits to, to allocate that funding fairly. Um, you know, they, you know, affordable housing is tough. It's my wife builds affordable housing and it's, you know, you have to cobble it together with 10 different funding sources. Um, so if you're talking about actually affordable housing, then you need more subsidy. Um, if you're talking about naturally affordable housing as in, which is a sort of interesting term, uh, you know, I think you have to start looking at building smaller units. I mean, that's really the only way to, to be able to do it. All right, so, um, well, thank you all for um, being part of the panel. Yeah. And, 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 and thank you, Ohan, for putting this on. This was an amazing, amazing event. You did a great job. So. And, and for everyone else that helped as well. Thank you all for coming. If, uh, if you're affiliated with UC Berkeley, can you please come to the, the center? We would like to take a group photo. Thank you again, appreciate it.